just say that I am so excited that I've been planning this for four months, five months. So excited to have a chance to interview Pastor Jared Stevens and his wife, Debbie. Would you join me? How you doing, man? Oh. Love you. Love you now, too. Debbie's coming, okay? Uh, I used to, you know that song, Easy Like Sunday Morning? All right? <laughs> When you're at home with four girls by yourself to get them up and get them out the door, ain't nothing easy about Sunday morning. I did it one time. I did it one time, and I promise you preaching a sermon is so much easier. So uh, she'll be here momentarily. She'll get here. Well, and, and when she gets here, we'll mic her up. We'll get her up here. That saves us from asking some of the early questions I was going to ask her, but I'm going to throw some of these at you immediately. Okay. All right, we've gotten glimpse into Jarrett Stevens, Pastor Jarrett, while you've been our pulpit uh, 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 presence for the last how many months? Five? Four. Four? Four Six. months. Four months. And you've given us glimpse and insights. You've got a book coming out. Uh, uh, I got to read your book. You did. I, I loved your book. I told Mark when I first came here, you know, everybody, I love, first of all, I love this class. I, I love Mark and Becky. Got to know Becky extremely well, yes. Uh, got to know Becky extremely well being on the search committee and had heard about Mark and just getting here, you know, these two have just been so good to me, uh, so great to me and my family, and uh, to have a class like this, like this isn't a class, you do understand this is a mega church in a mega church right here, okay, <laughs> and uh, I just love being here, love this guy, and I told him, I said, Mark, I'm never going to ask you for a thing, and, uh, and, and I broke that, that the first week because I called him while I was running one day, remember this, I said, Mark, I got to break my deal, I said, I was never going to ask you for anything, well, you endorse my book that's coming out in June. And so uh, he said, absolutely, send it to me. And he actually read it. You know, most people are like, yeah, I'll do that. And they don't read it. He read it. So anyway, thank well, you for doing I, that. I'm pretty stoked. It's a really good book. We've got copies ordered for all of you for yeah, when it so comes good. out. So, so you'll be getting a copy. Becky and I are just so stoked to share the book with you. But in the book, you are really good at divulging part of your life, the ways that you have have internalized and lived out matters of scripture. So within the framework of that, uh, I want you to tell us a little bit about your book. Okay, it's called The Always God, He Hasn't Changed and You're Not Forgotten. And I wrote it during the quarantine uh, last year. Um, didn't have anything else to do, so why not write a book, right? <laughs> and so, uh, but not only that, I, was, I, w I knew that God had been turning in my heart. There was something churning, uh, and I knew that he was doing something in me at that time uh, that was getting ready and preparing me. I didn't know it would be Champion Forest and a move to Houston, but I knew he was doing something. And all of us uh, know what it's like to go, God, do you see the situation that I'm in right now? Like, I've been praying, God, do you even hear what's going on when I say these prayers to you? Uh, God, would, would you speak to me? I feel like I'm not hearing. We all, all feel that way from time to time. And so what I did was uh, I wrote the book in three parts. Uh, it's called The Always God because that's who he is. He's the always God. The scripture says, Psalm 9, chapter 90, verse 2, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And so the first part is God is always here. And I just unpack that he's always seeing us. He's always hearing us when we pray to him, and he's always speaking to us through his word. Uh, the second part is he's always working. And so I talk about how he's always pursuing the lost. He's always comforting the lonely, what I'm going to talk about in the message today. He's always uh, helping the fearful. He's always, I just talk about how he's always at work. That's the second part. And the third part is how he's always faithful. Uh, that you, he can always be trusted, he can always be counted on, he is the always God. So that was it. This is fantastic. We can't, I, trust me, what he, what he does when he writes is he weaves in solid scripture with solid theology or explanation of the scripture with an amazing personal story and application, which is a magnificent way of taking God's grandiose revelation making sense of it in our minds, but applying it in our lives. How do you pull that off? Uh, I do not know. Here's, here, my, dad, my dad's a brick mason, okay? He was a brick mason for 40 years, 
And he gave me the best preaching advice I'd ever been given. I've been in seminary. I've got my master's, my doctorate, sent under some incredible professors. But my dad, who is a blue-collar brick mason, gave me the best advice uh, in preaching that I've ever been given. He said this, that, Jared, when you start uh, preaching, you need to put it on a shelf where everybody can get it. Mm. And don't make it too up here where people can't understand it. Don't make it, you know, too simple where people just check out because they've heard it all before. Just get it on a shelf where everybody can get it. And for some reason, that just stuck with me. So when I write these books, my first one, The Mountains Are Calling and The Always God, and even as I think about preaching, uh, that I'm, I'm, I write it with my dad in mind. Just a simple blue-collar man. If he can get it, then I feel like, all right, anybody can. Okay, so when I was in high school, I worked at a little convenience store. And that's where I learned a similar subject, mm -hmm. except it dealt with Campbell's Soup. And, and the, 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 the owner of the store said, chicken noodle soup and cream of mushroom soup, everybody will come to buy. So just stick it on the bottom. People will bend down and grab that all the time. But the stuff that, that people will, will not, they don't come in to buy cream of asparagus soup. Right. You know, stick that on eye level because that's something that they'll reach out and take. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Not that's as good it. as your dad's, no, no, but that is. you know, that's really good. it was okay. It's really good. It did affect me. To you go to a grocery store, it's always that way. Yeah, and they always stick you know. bread and milk in the back, so you pass everything else to go get it and that's buy it. other things. That's it. All right. So growing up, family of origin, you've got. Uh, uh, you were not an only child. I am not. Middle children unite. All Amen. Right? That's who I am. Amen. <laughs> yes. See, that's why we. That's why we get along. That's it. it. That's it, uh, man. So I had an older brother. Yeah. Uh, two years older than me, three years older than me, a younger sister two years younger than me. So I'm right there in the middle, great mom and dad, nuclear family there. And uh, we're close to this day. We, we've got the family text chain going where we're, you know, All right, shots at someone everybody. in your family, an aunt I recall mm -hmm. or somebody, had, had done, you had a picture and they'd done some verse or yep. something. Uh, you got to tell that story because we've got grandparents, parents, and parents to be in the sense of young kids in here. Yep. That is just an amazing thing I wish I'd known about when my kids were younger. Yeah, Tell it's us. A, it's amazing what you remember when you're a child, right? Just things that you never think that you're going to remember. And I had an aunt that would cross stitch. And I've actually got this picture in my office upstairs. Uh, but she gave it to me, my brother and sister, as a gift. And one of it was a, a picture of me. I think I was in the second grade. And it had my name out beside it. And then it just had a verse, uh, and this verse was 2 Timothy 4, 7. I fought a good fight, I finished the course, I've kept the faith. And uh, she gave that to us as a gift. And so in my home growing up were these three cross stitches that I would look at. I, I, I can remember as a kid just looking at it, seeing my picture there, and just looking at that Bible verse. And I think this is part of, uh, you know, uh, what Moses said in Deuteronomy, right? That we talk about the scripture as we go about our day. We put it on our, our door frames. We, we think about it. We talk about it just in the everyday comings and goings. And so that verse just captured my heart as a little kid. And, and it's, it is my life verse. That, and, and, when, and when I think about ministry, when I think about being a pastor, uh, when I think about just being a, a husband and a father, I, I want to be faithful. Like it's not how I start that is important, but it's how I end that's important. And so that verse, that verse captured my heart and uh, just means the world to me. Okay, now, I'm, and I'm hopscotching a little bit through the, what I'd planned on talking about and, and asking you about. Uh, this one's a little bit from left field. Um, we've got, uh, I sent you an email a couple of weeks ago. We've got a young gentleman in here, Marius, who's sitting right there at that table. There he is. Who, yeah, who is an exchange student from Germany. And I've got a, uh, he, he wants to be baptized before he goes back. And so I had emailed you and said, hey, uh, usually we do those in our class at the annual picnic, um, uh, but we won't get to that picnic in time for him. What do you think? We should do, and you said May 16th, That's right. we're going to do a baptism day in a sense, yep. and you're going to baptize a boatload of people at the service, Planning and I'll it. be baptizing Marius at the service, yep. and uh, we may have other people in here who have not been baptized. I want you to tell the story about your brother getting baptized. Oh, I'd love to. It's one of my favorites. Uh, first of all, if you haven't been baptized, and we say biblically baptized, right? You've gotten your baptism on the right side of your salvation. 
Uh, part of my wife's story, and she may share this when she gets here, is uh, she trusted Christ in college. She had been baptized as a kid, but really didn't trust Christ until college. And so we had been married about a year, and she calls me. I'm on staff at, at a church in, in Dallas. And she calls me about a year in. She was being discipled, and she said, Jared, I really feel like I need to be baptized. And I was kind of embarrassed. I'll be honest with you. I was like, uh, we've been, we, we dated for a year and a half, uh, <laughs> engaged, married for a year. I feel like we covered this subject, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, God just wore, he, you know, I was, there's no way I was going to get in the, in the middle of what God was doing. Uh, because uh, she just felt this burden that I needed to be baptized. And so one of, the, one of the great privileges of my life was standing in the waters and baptizing my wife. Uh, and I say that to say there's some people in here that maybe you, 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 know, you uh, uh, made a decision when you were a child, but it wasn't yours. You didn't own it. Uh, you really didn't know what you were doing. Or maybe you come from a different faith background. Uh, my brother-in-law is uh, a, a Catholic, and when I talk to him about baptism, I always try to tell our Catholic brothers and sisters because there's such a, a tenderness there to what they were grew, grew up in. They feel like if they're baptized by immersion that they're kind of maybe dishonoring their mom and dad. I say, no, 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 no. You're building on what your mom and dad invested in you. There's a foundation there. So when you're in the waters of baptism, you, you're asking a preacher to, talk, to answer just Am I going too much? You're, so you're Buddy, in the waters of baptism. You're here. Come on. You know, your body's making a cross, right? It's, everything's symbolic. It's picturesque. And, and when we, you, you assume the dead man's position because that's what you're doing. You're dying to sin. You're dying to self. And so when we say you are buried with Christ in baptism, you are buried all the way put under. Uh, not, you know, we don't sprinkle water on you. We put you all the way under. It's bapti- that's the, what the word baptizo in the Greek means. It means to immerse, to plunge under. And so we go all the way under representing your death, all the way back up representing the resurrection of Christ. And if you've never been biblically baptized by immersion, I want to encourage you to do it. Uh, there is nothing embarrassing about it. It's all celebratory. It's awesome. Uh, and it shows the world what you believe and to whom you belong. So Mari and I, I'm fired up uh, that Mark's going to get to <laughs> baptize you. Uh, Mark, the six, uh, uh, May the 16th, uh, it'll be my first time to baptize here at Champion Force. And so I'm fired up to do that and, if you, and would love to baptize you uh, if you want to sign up. And again, Mark's going to be in the water with me that day, baptize Morris. It's going to be a great day. So my brother's baptism, all right? Yep. So here's the deal. Getting there. <laughs> we, grew up, <clears throat> we grew up in the same family, all right? Mom and dad. Grew He's two up years older. Two years older. Went to the same church growing up, same church camp, same vacation Bible schools. When my brother left the university, uh, when he left high school, he went to the University of Southern Mississippi, okay? And he, he joined the Pike Fraternity House, all right? I've seen some things that I still can't get out of my mind at the Pike Fraternity House. And so uh, when he left home, he left the church, never came back. And for 17 years, I prayed for my brother. And I would talk to my brother about his faith all the time. And every time I would bring it up, we'd, we'd be at, you know, because we got together in summers, we were a close family. Every time I would bring it up, my brother would just say, Jarrett, save it. Save it. And so uh, it just burned me. And so here he is. He graduates the University of Southern Mississippi. He moves to New Orleans. He's got a <laughs> wife and two kids. He's, you know, this is 10 years after graduating college. He still thinks he's president of the Pike Fraternity House, if you get what I'm saying there. And uh, I'm in ministry. And so we were very close to my grandfather. My grandfather passes away in 2014. And I remember going to his funeral. We were out there just talking. And for the first time, my brother said, um, he said, Jared, I really need to get into church. And I said, Eric, look, I don't, I don't know much about anything, but I know about church. <laughs> and we planted a church in New Orleans, a church plant. And I said, my buddy's the pastor there. Why don't you just go there and just give it two times? If you go and don't want anything to do with it, after just giving it two times, I'll never bring it up again. And he left, went back to New Orleans. I drove back to Dallas the next day, which was a Sunday. And I remember pulling, uh, I, was, I was checking social media. I pulled over to the side of the road to check social I'm sure media. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I saw, <laughs> I saw, uh, uh, Vintage Church New Orleans, which is the church that we help plant. He said, and the, the, the Twitter account said, we have a packed house, so full today, people are sitting outside. And I push on the picture, and my brother's sitting there. And so I start ramping up the prayers big time because I know God's going to be dealing with his heart. Long story short, about two weeks later, he calls me, tells me that his wife is leaving him. Uh, there was a divorce ensuing. He was at a place of misery. And that's what God does sometimes, right? Like to get our attention, he just throws a big trial in our lap to make us look up. And I said, Eric, you're either going to bow your neck and be prideful and arrogant, or 
you're going to bend your knee and, and, and bow to the Lord Jesus Christ who's pursuing you. And he called me the next day. He said, Jared, i got to get my life right. And uh, he uh, gave his life to Christ. I went down there in November. This was in February. I went down in November of 2017. I preached at the church that we helped plant, baptized him in the back of a pickup truck. And uh, now he's, he loves Jesus and, uh, you know, just he's an awesome guy. Man, God restored. I mean, it's an amazing story. Oh, that's, that's marvelous. I love hearing that. Okay, um, uh, you've got kids. Four of them. And they're all girls. Sorority house. And you, you, you are, um, uh, your last two are twins. Yes. Now, the twins are how old? Nine. And what you've got to do is, is you were giving Becky and I advice, you and Debbie were, to tell our daughter, Gracie, who's pregnant with twins, about what she and JT need to expect and look forward to. Yes. And you told me a story that you may not want to tell publicly. Oh, I have no problem telling. Was, okay. I said what they have to look <laughs> I said what they have to look forward to is absolute misery for the first 4 to 6 months, all right? That's what they have to look forward to. So our twins were born, Debbie's getting mic'd. Hey Debbie, Debbie's coming. Oh, uh, Debbie. We so, got stories. Uh, we were looking. So, um, so the twins, uh, okay, so we had the the first two. Well, Okay, now you don't get to tell about how you get sick every time your wife no, goes into labor. No, I won't labor. go there. I, I want go you there. to talk about what you used <laughs> to do on the balcony. Uh, that's what I'm doing. Okay, I'm get getting there. there. But All I've right. got to set it up. Set right? it up. I'm, Take your time. Context is everything. Take your time. So um, the first two I didn't do anything with. My wife was the caretaker. You know, she was, she was the one taking care of them at night. I would stay, you know, do the late session about 10 o'clock. And then I'd go to bed, wake up the next morning. Everything's great. Well, when you have twins, they got to be on the same deal or it becomes a nightmare right so that it put me to work and so for the first four to six months of that routine I I'd never I was miserable I was not getting any sleep because they were up all during the night come here babe uh welcome Debbie Stevens <laughs> yeah, ladies Stevens. and gentlemen right. Debbie Stevens come on up uh <clears throat> and so what Mark is is getting at is the first four I would go to the office the next day and our church in the top, top row of the balcony, it had these air conditioner ducts, and it felt so good. And I would tell my assistant, if anybody needs me, uh, call me on my cell phone, and I would go up there and take a nap on the top <laughs> row of the balcony <laughs> during the day. I'd just put my phone on the chest, and, and, and that's the only way I survived the first four to six months. So Yeah, ask I'm, me where I took my nap. I'm done <laughs> complaining. I'm done complaining. Exactly. I'm not complaining. Okay, Debbie, we yeah. got a little catch up with you. Yeah, um, sorry, nobody told me the time. Oh, I didn't. That's <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, I'm cruising around saying hi to people, getting my coffee, and uh, well, you know. welcome. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. Um, um, we, 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 nobody's left. Um, yes. Okay, so <laughs> communication such a strong thing it in is. marriage. It you is. Wanna, it is. It is. And and I've saved those questions till the end. <laughs> um, so here's here's where I'd like to pick up with you. Debbie, tell us a little bit about you growing up, your family of origin stuff. Okay, so I am the youngest of two daughters, grew up in Richardson, Texas, where my mom was from, her mom was from, her mom was from. Um, we grew up going to attending First Baptist Richardson, where my parents still are faithful members. Um, and we were there pretty much every time the door was open. My parents were, my dad especially, my dad, I think he still teaches 8 a.m., seventh grade boys. Um, Bible Fellowship, I don't know, probably. If they still have it, he's doing it. So Wow. That's wow. kind of my And foundation. you went to school at Baylor. I did. I did. Were, were, did you come from a Baylor family, or did you just decide to sick them bears? My sister went to Baylor. Okay. Um, my old, older sister went to Baylor and graduated in three and a half years, like top ten of her class. So um, my parents were big fans of Baylor. They did not. They went to... Um, North Texas and Sam Houston, but they just, they loved Baylor. They knew so many people that kids went there and they just thought it was the best education for us. So it was, well, you can go to Baylor or you can pay your tuition. So that's pretty much when we were like, you know, sick and bears. But I, I went just following in the footsteps of my sister. I took her extra semester and I think graduated in the bottom 10 of my class. So we evened it out to a nice, healthy education. You know, half of everybody you meet is below average. Good. I mean, if you think about it, we all balance each other out somehow. I'm going to put that in the compliments category. Uh, yeah, 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 no, no, no. I'm, uh, 
I'm, I'm just saying that, that we're, you know, we're all over the spectrum on that. Yeah. Um, um, okay, so I want to know how you two met and, and, and fell in love and, and this kind of stuff. And Debbie, I would like to hear it from you instead of from him, please. That's a good thing. You want the more accurate... Yes. <laughs> like painted with a small, thin paintbrush. Yes. Whereas the male usually has this full picture. I'll fill in the bravado. gaps. I'll fill in the gaps. <laughs> Go ahead. So I had been at our church for maybe two or three years and was um, in the singles ministry already. And I was helped directing a class. And one of our singles ministers moved to Austin. So they pulled up an intern into the singles ministry. And it was this blue-eyed, friendly, friendly guy that I was not the least bit looking for. I was done. I was like, I'm, I'm done, especially in boys in leadership. I'm done. And then here comes this minister, and we just, um, my class fell under his umbrella of leadership in the singles ministry, so there was submission problems right off the bat. Um, but I just, I really admired him. I, I probably was slow getting out of the gate. He was um, amazing. He was very forthright. He didn't play games. He was very um, easy to get to know. He just kind of paved the path for, he knew we would be married and fell in love probably on day one, guys, you know. Um, I know and, what I want. Yeah. And when I want, so I'm going after it. On I don't have yeah. to be convinced. Yeah. So we were friends for a while, but we probably really connected. Our uh, singles ministry had this Valentine's barn bash, this country western thing. And we, I remember he walked up to my table of friends, and we were all sitting around. And by the end of the night, he and I were the only ones left at the table. Um, and so I just was, I was cautious, not because of him at all. He was very easy to fall in love with. You're not supposed to date people in your ministry. You know, yeah, that's yeah. like a, it was like an unwritten rule. It's kind of taboo. But I figured I was just an intern slash associate at the time. And they weren't paying me enough anyway. And so I was going to get something out of this deal. <laughs> and, and so I did, I met her that first night. And I'm, this, is a, this is the honest truth. I walk her out to her car because we're, we're like finishing up and we close out the night. I walk her out and she's, she's driving a Jeep like a Jeep Wrangler, and I'm like, this girl's amazing. She's amazing. <laughs> I mean, I told my roommates that night, I was like, I just met my wife. I, I just met my wife. This is her. This is her. Yeah, so uh, if you're single, women, go get a Jeep Wrangler. <laughs> there you go. That's it. Um, uh, uh, so y'all, y'all have got kids. Um, we've talked a little bit about that. Um, uh, Give us some, a little more insight in, into your marriage in terms of, you know, how do you make, I, I tell my kids, who I want you to marry, if dad gets to pick, is someone that brings out the best in you. The best in you spiritually, educationally, emotionally. You know, I, I want someone who makes you the best you because I've seen people in relationships with people who bring out the worst in them. Mm. And, and it's, it's such a sad difference. No. So how do y'all bring out the best in each other? Well, I'll start, and then maybe you can answer it. Uh, this is true. What I've known about Debbie since first meeting her is I met her, and she was serving in the church. Every, uh, 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 since the first time I met her, we'll be married 19 years in November, uh, she has been serving. And uh, it's just her heart. And so uh, that's one of the main things that attracted me to her. And she served in student ministry. She served in young singles ministry. She served in our choir. She is, if it's in the church, she is there serving. And so that was the first thing that attracted me to her. And then just her example. Like if you come to our house, and she, she would never tell you this, but I bet we've got 12 years worth of Bibles that Debbie has read through the Bible every year with notes in them, and I just think, man, what a legacy of faith for our girls. I say that to say uh, one of the things that she makes me better, Mark, is just by, by her example. It's, it, I mean, she's, she's in the Word. Uh, she is uh, passionate about the Lord, and so that's one of the things I really admire about Debbie, and uh, it makes me, you know, want to be better. All right, Debbie, how does your husband bring out the best in you? I'm sure a lot of prayer on his side. He's very patient. 
um, he lets the Lord deal with me. He does. He does not um, interject when there is a scenario for discipline, when there is especially a scenario for growth. He just, um, he just walks beside me, and I, I, he's very faithful. Um, he's very trustworthy. He's just very easy to, not, I'm not going to say live with necessarily, but to do life with. He's just, he's easy, and it just, looking at him and how he loves people and loves the Lord and how he is just gracious and so, and just quick to lead, quick to forgive, just all those qualities, I just want to be better. Like, I just, I look at, he sharpens me by just his natural um, living and living for the Lord. To be fair, I tried to fi- I tried to fix it one time, and I I learned. I was like, all right, God, she's yours from now yeah. on. I can't do that. No, God does a much totally, better job I'm totally at fixing me. Yeah. I'm totally kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I tried that once, all right? Yeah. 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 Well, just That's once. the Lord. Hey, that I'm that totally shows that, that shows greatness that you only did it once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> some of us had didn't learn that lesson for about five years. Um, uh, no. Uh, so, uh, I, I I love the way you answered that. Debbie, because it allows me to tell everybody, you need to be here next Sunday when we look at Galatians 5, 16, and 17, because in the Greek, I will show you how what Debbie said is a concrete example of how God's Spirit regulates us beyond our living by the law or the flesh or our external to-do list. We live from the inside out, not from the outside in. Mm. And we'll be talking about that in Galatians 5, 16, and 17 next week in ways that will make you say, well, that's what Debbie was talking about last Sunday. Thank you, Debbie, for that plug that you didn't know you gave me. Um, Ministry. I want to talk about your favorite part, Jarrett, of being the senior pastor or being in ministry and then, Debbie, I want to talk about your favorite part of him being there. Okay. All right. Okay. Jarrett? I think it's an easy, easy answer. Uh, my favorite part uh, of ministry, I, I, it's twofold. And I told the search committee this uh, when we were talking. Um, I've got to preach, right? It's like Jeremiah, there's a fire in my bones and, and I can't hold it in. So the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, I mean, I look forward to Sunday. Like, I can't wait for this next hour to get here to preach and teach God's Word. Uh, but, and, and so that's the part of ministry that uh, I love. Opening up a text, as you do, Mark, studying it, not knowing where it's going to go necessarily. And God, by the power of His Holy Spirit, by the time you get out of that study and writing that, you got a word from the Lord. I mean, it's just that, there's something to that that you can't replace. And then second is just the people part. Like, I don't want to just be, be a preacher. I, I, I've got a, God has knit, wired me to have a pastor's heart. And so I love this. I love the relationship part as much as I do the preaching part. This doesn't tire me out. This fires me up. Now, I'll take a nap this afternoon. Don't get me wrong. But uh, I love uh, I love being with people. So th- those two aspects right there. Okay, so um, uh, one of the joys I've had is watching you and, and Pastor David connect because I, I work with Pastor David a bunch. And, and he and I, I don't know if I've told you this or not, we're having a dialogue about why you are such an incredible preacher, okay? Because he's been watching you on the internet and, and loves you and thinks you are God's answer for this church and you are the one and, and he's just all agog as, as I am. Um, but, but he and I put our finger on it. You want to hear what we've come up with? I would love to. Okay. Some people preach because they know how and they enjoy it. And they're able to preach and they know God's called them to preach. Other people people preach because deep in their heart is something they absolutely know to be true and they will explode if they don't get it out and share it. And that's you. Oh, thank you. And thank that's you. you. I see that as a compliment. And, and it's thank a you. huge compliment because there, I, I told Jared also, I grew up in a church where we didn't call our pastor's pastor. We called him our preacher. And only if we liked him. (laughs) So I frequently call him my preacher uh, just as much as my pastor because that's the highest compliment I can say. I love the way you open the word and thank you for sharing it. Thank you. All right, Debbie, what is your favorite part of him being a senior pastor? 
I mean, there's a lot. Like, I've watched this man go from intern to minister to te teaching pastor for 10 years, and it just seems like it's one of those bungee jump videos without, like, he's just soared off the edge. Mm. And it is just such a privilege to watch him just have been able to spread his wings and fly and do what he's always been called to do. And I, and y'all see the energy and that is real. He has a lot of energy and <laughs> a lot, but you see it on that stage because he's passionate and he loves the Lord and he loves the word and he wants it to be so contagious to the people, to all the ears that are open around him. But it's just been a privilege just to see him just be able to spread his wings and um, and just fly and just and just do what he's always been called to do. So, do you know what he's going to preach before he preaches? Sometimes, most of the time, yep. So he'll kind of run it by you or talk to you about it. Oh yeah. Do no. you ever? No, not, do you ever? Not for comments. Sometimes he'll ask me, like, "What's a good illustration for this?" Or can you think of anything that our family's gone through? Maybe something like that, but. I'll just, I mean, let's be honest. Like, this is the scholar here. I'm not. Like, I brought my Bible up to the stage in case there's a question. He, <laughs> so if he, if he refers anything back to me, it is maybe for a personal experience or does this make sense? Does this flow kind of thing? Kind of discernment, you know, if, if I say it in this way, how does that come across? Yeah. You know, stuff like or that. Or will this be funny? Yeah. Because yeah. that's, that's my, so it's over that's the line. my expertise. Yeah. 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 Okay, now you brought your Bible up here, Debbie, but I can I... Look, this thing is well-thumbed. Here, can we go to the Elmo? Yeah. Or to the IPVO? Look, this thing's got like post-it notes. We don't have it up. It's my travel Bible, so okay. I oh, keep there we it go. in the Look, glove compartment of my car. This thing's well-thumbed through. You've got notes throughout, underlining post-it notes this is this is not like just on a coffee table right and that's not our study bible like our study bible at home it'd be like twice yeah that. like i like the big like an esv bible but the big thick study bible because i need i need the no, i want the notes at the bottom i want the cross referencing i want to be able to draw she, and underline. she makes christmas very easy because yes. one gift every year is going to be that esv study bible yeah, every year. a new Bible every year. Every oh, year. that's fantastic. Um, okay, what's the hardest part of being senior pastor, and what do you think is most challenging in that role, maybe even for you as a wife of a senior pastor? The hardest part for me is, <clears throat> as you can probably tell in my personality, type A, go-getter, uh, visionary. I see things that I know, oh, man. This is where we need to be. This is where I feel like the Lord's leading us to be. And just being patient and pacing. Like I'm looking at this, honest to goodness. Uh, I'm looking at, at being the senior pastor here, Lord willing, for the next 20 to 25 years. All right? That's what I want. That's what I'm praying. And so, it, and so it's just saying, okay, uh, we don't have to tinker with that. Right? You know, we'll get there, but we don't have to get there next week. And so just being patient and uh, not getting too far out in front of our staff or you, our people, so that we're leading in an honorable way. So that's the biggest challenge, wrapping our arms around a church that has four campuses across Northwest Houston uh, and just understanding that, you know, uh, we don't have to do anything tomorrow. It, we'll get there. Just be patient. That's the hardest part. All right. What's the hardest part of being the wife of the senior pastor or the hardest thing you see with him? Well... I'm only four months in. This is my first time as a senior pastor's wife. So I really, there's a lot of times where the enemy is just like, you're not prepared, you're clueless, you're ill-equipped, and that is not true. I was under a great pastor and a, a great pastor's wife for 20 years and um, 22 as a member, and um, there are so, there's so much that I've brought from it, but Honestly, right now, I'm like, this is the honeymoon phase. Like, this is great. Um, I, do, I don't know yet what my role looks like. And I never knew what it looked like as a teaching pastor's wife, as the singles minister's wife, as an, you know, an intern's wife. I never knew. I just trusted the Lord that he would point me in that direction, that he would put that opportunity in front of me and make it clear. And that's what, how I feel will define my role here, too. I am by nature active. I love people. 
Um, I love ministry. I love God's word. So um, I plan on being fully visible and lovable. And um, I guess maybe the hardest part is not a lot yet because he's just doing what he was always called to do. And so there's so much joy that comes from that and just a ton of peace that we're here and we're, we're ready. Um, but I think when I'm aware when the enemy's getting at him or when the enemy's trying to come at our church, there's a different feeling now. I, I, I realize I'm in a different, I'm in a completely different seat than I've ever been in. But I'm in a seat in front of a church that's full of just very patient, gracious loving people that I've seen so far, so. Well, we're glad you're here. I told, <laughs> I've, I've told multiple people, uh, including Jared, Pastor Jared, that uh, um, I have never prayed for the health of a senior minister as much as I've prayed for the health of Jack Graham. <laughs> now, you may be saying, who's Jack Graham? Jack Graham is the senior minister at the church we stole Jared from. <laughs> and I don't want anything happening to him until Jarrett and Debbie's roots are so deep here that that church can't call them back because I know exactly who they'd go after. Oh, yeah. So uh, uh, join me in praying that Jack Graham has a long and fruitful ministry in front of him <laughs> and that uh, we get to keep Pastor Jarrett and Debbie for as long as possible. We're here. Okay, I, we've got, uh, uh, we're in our last, uh, uh, this class I divide into three 15-minute segments. We're going into the last 15-minute segment here. And so I want to talk to you about life in Christ. Now, you've given us your life verse, uh, uh, Pastor Jarrett, and, and it's a, an amazing life verse. Debbie, do you have a life verse or a I favorite do. verse? And I'm going to read it too so that I, my nerves don't miss a single word of it. So mine is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. And it's, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And I feel like my life, I could just stop right there and just dwell on that part of the verse. Um, but, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. You know, Debbie, that is a splendid opportunity for me to tell everybody that next week we're going to be looking at Galatians 5, 16, and 17. <laughs> Because it's the perfect explanation of Debbie's life verse. They fit together like pieces of a puzzle. And they so complement and bring out the meaning in each other. I do hope you'll be here. Um, so Debbie, that is fantastic. Now, Pastor Jarrett, your favorite verses or subject or whatever to teach, to share, to preach. Could you pick any? Probably if there was a wheelhouse, I guess. Uh, it would be uh, probably evangelism, sharing your faith. Uh, I love the Great Commission, Ma Matthew 28, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. That would probably be, if there was a wheelhouse, if you just said get up and preach your heart, it would be just that whole idea of sharing your faith, going on mission for Christ. And why is that? What, what is it about that? I, you know, I, I'm a, I, have a, uh, I talk to our staff about this. Uh, you know, as leaders, we need to have a bias toward action. Uh, you, you know, they're, they're in ministry. My pet peeve is laziness in ministry. Like, I can't stand it. It's easy to, to be lazy. Uh, and, and so, uh, I don't, uh, we, we need to have a bias toward action. The, the Christian faith is an active faith. Over 1,400 times in the scripture, the word go is mentioned. And most of the time, it's, it's, it's God speaking to his prophets, his priests, his king, Jesus to his disciples after saying something to them. Now it's time to go. And so uh, I just think that's, that's where we, we move in faith when we're going on mission for him. Uh, it's, it's, it's when we seek God uh, take us where we didn't think we could ever do, do in and of ourselves. It's because we're, we're going. It's, we're on mission. And so there's just something about that where our faith grows. I just don't want us to ever have a stagnant faith. And most of the time when our faith is anemic, when it's stagnant, is because we're not doing anything. We're not using our spiritual muscles. And I think just going in his name does something like okay, that. Okay, we really did not practice this. And we really did not rehearse this. And I really had no clue what he was saying. But honestly, that's Galatians 5.16. <laughs> I'm <laughs> Paul uses the word peripateo in the Greek, which means to walk out. So it's just walking. But when Paul's doing it, he's not using it in the sense of walking. 
He's using it in the sense, sense of life. The, the Hebrew, it's a Hebraism for the Hebrew word halach, which means to, 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 to live, to go about, to, to walk, but, it, but it's part of life because we have an active faith. We, we, you don't sit through life. You, in, in the Hebrew and in the Greek concept, you walk by the Spirit. You, you, you don't sit by the Spirit. You walk. It's, it's an active it's beautiful. life. It's progressive. And can I just say what an incredible gift, and I'm not just saying this because he's here. I've told a, thousands of people, not thousands, hundreds. I've been a little preacher talk there. But I've told a <laughs> lot of people uh, about uh, the beauty of having a, a guy like Mark Lanier in your church that loves God's Word. Um, that you. knows the Greek and the Hebrew. Like, do you realize what that means for a preacher? Like, I can call and say, hey, I just read this in a commentary. Is it even true? And he can, like, <laughs> actually read the original language and tell me. It's unbelievable, a gift. And to have him here every single week teaching our church, there's a reason that Champion Forest is as strong spiritually as it is. It's because we we build our believers on the Bible. And when you've got guys like this that are teaching God's word, we got them all throughout our church, but a guy like this, I love him too. And so anyway, it's just a gift. It's also intimidating. It's also intimidating. I better have my junk together when I get in that pool pit because I know he's looking. I go, that doesn't mean that. So anyway, I always, no, no, no. I always ask I, I got to tell you, I love I, it. this morning I was so excited and I thought, you know, I'm excited to get to visit with y'all because it's one of my favorite things to do, Becky and I both. I'm excited to get to share y'all, which is, is an honor, but I'm excited to get to hear your sermon. I mean, I'm just, I really enjoy hearing you preach each Sunday. Thank you. I'm excited I'm to excited. preach I'm excited. So, so thank you for your kind words. All right. So, so Debbie, um, I know that you've also spent a lifetime teaching and serving and all. Do you have a favorite subject or something to teach or to share that, that really burns in your heart? I do. Um, I would say it's two main things. The first one is just the true story of redemption. I love mm. Ruth. Ruth was a story, a, a woman that captured my heart and just gave me a great example up front. Just do the work. God will show you. Do the work. God will provide. Um, and then, but my most recent redemption is Rahab. Yeah, I got picked the harlot. to teach. Yes, who wants to teach on the harlot? <laughs> um, I got picked to teach her, and it was so life giving. She has an incredible story, but the most incredible thing is just the redemption from her um, original story. That is, it's it was just amazing. So I would say redemption is huge. I think we as women um, and the younger generations need to hear what God can do with what you've brought. Um, but my, I would say my passion, like where I can feel my heart rate up, you can see I get a little motion like Jarrett gets when he preaches. If I'm preaching on um, reading your Bible, that is, it's just such a passion of mine. I love it so much that I used to call it my quiet time. And now I call it my tag, my time alone with God, because I don't want it to be quiet. I don't want to be quiet before him. And I really want to hear from him. And I just love, I, I think there's never a bad season in life just to get a fresh perspective on how, how it's going and how you can maybe tweak it or how the Lord's encouraging you to stretch a little bit. Or So when do you do your time alone with God? Is it one set time or, or does it vary? Tell us about that. My preference and always my goal is very first thing in the morning. Um, I want as much of my cup from yesterday to be poured out and empty and filled up with him before my kids come and start bumping into that cup <laughs> or the world comes or phone calls or emails or whatever it is. Um, I want as much of what the Lord filled me with to come spilling out. Um, so I love just a great cup of coffee and um, my time in the word in the morning. How about you, Pastor? Oh, absolutely. Morning. I call it uh, I've got a mentor in my life, Dr. Ronnie Floyd, who's um, uh, executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention, and he taught a long time ago to have an hour of power, he calls it his hour of power, and so it's early in the morning, uh, I get up, I, I look so forward to a cup of coffee and my a Bible, and I'm a big journaler, uh, and so that's, that's it, and I protect that time like crazy. Okay, coffee, uh, what kind do you drink? Straight black. Just whatever, you know, whatever's on tap. It doesn't matter. Okay, coffee, what kind do you drink and how do you take it? I like it to taste as much like candy as possible. <laughs> 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 so 
So any flavors or sweeteners? I've gotten into an Americano. I'm trying to head down a healthier route in what I eat and, and even my coffee. So, but it still needs to be candy. I need candy. Yeah. Well, just <laughs> stir it with broccoli. Um, yeah. So, so what is God teaching you right now? Do do you sense that there's a, a specific either area of your life or or something in your heart, or is is there some direction or teaching where God is growing you right now? Uh, personally, uh, for me, uh, the the call to uh, prayer is more and more and more. What I'm hearing the Lord say to me, to me is, Jared, I need more time with you, not less. And I, I think the weight of that is being a, a, a pastor of a church like this. I just feel the weight of I just need more time with God. I need more time with God. I need more time with God. And so that's a real burden for me right now. Deb? Yeah, he's speaking loudly, and I'm so grateful he's faithful to it, too, because I don't know if you know this about me, but the last couple of months has been a lot of change, a lot of transition, a lot of new. And I have felt um, I left broken. He needed to break me down to be able to build me back up and to prepare me for the new new church, new school, new city, new roads, new traffic scenario, new everything. Um, so I really feel like now it is this um, strengthening. And I simply, like, maybe a week ago, I went to the, what's that app we've been using for the prayer? I mean, for the plan. Is it just the Holy Bible app? For the plan. The 100-day reading Oh, the plan. Uversion app. Okay, yeah. Uversion app. So I just went on there and I scrolled their reading plans. I love reading plans. I need structure. Um, not to be able to check the boxes, but just to follow along. So I went on there and I looked up um, what I thought would be a reading plan for strength. And it happens to be in the title of like overcoming fear, which I don't feel like I have fear. I just want him, I want to see my foundation again. And I just want to be built back up in the word and just going back over his promises and his promises to me where he'll be and what he'll do for me. Um, yeah, I, I just feel like he's, he's just strengthening me right now. Oh, that's fantastic. It gives me an idea for my thoughts for the week coming up. So thank you. I'm so glad we could prompt everything <laughs> of your, anytime you need us. Hey, no, I'm, I'm serious. I, I'm thinking, <laughs> hey, that can fit into my video thoughts for the week next week. I've been praying. God, give me some guidance. So there thank you. you. You're welcome. Um, um, okay, so uh, uh, we're going to hit the lightning round here in just a moment. But before we do... Uh, uh, I need to ask you, we've got different age groups here. And so between the three of us, but really between the two of you, because I do it all the time here, I want to try and speak into each age group. Okay. And generally we start with the young people and we go to the, the, the older age groups. Um, and so we might as well do it that way now. So if we've got people in here that are pre-high school, so think about your twins, think about your, your, your pre-high school age kids. What word of encouragement could you give them? Either uh, of you uh, take one, we'll alternate, do it however you want. Debbie, what word of encouragement, I'll start with you, because you've got a mother's heart. What word of encouragement would you give? I would just say that you will never regret, regret obedience. Um, there will never be guilt and shame from obeying God's word and obeying where he's directing your life and guiding your path, your steps and your path. Um, I would just say just to, just to learn that skill of, of just what it looks like to be obedient and that it's not always going to feel good. Um, it's not, may not feel, you may not be happy, um, but obedience is always worth it. Ah, that's fantastic. All right, and so they hit the teenage years. What advice do you have for teenagers? Uh, uh, Jarrett can take this one. Well, uh, you know, uh, I, would, I would say with purity, there's power. I, I would really, you know, the enemy so bad wants to steal our teenagers' purity uh, because of this whole idea of shame and regret, and, uh, and it's coming at them, right? I mean, it's just a different day than it was when even I was a teenager. And so I would really, I would really just implore them to fight for their purity. 
Okay. All right, let's, let's uh, progress through the years. You hit your 20s, you're getting out of college, you're going in to figure out what kind of job, what kind of life is going to be like after college. Which one of you want to speak into that age? Me? Uh, I would say, uh, you know, with purity there's power, guard your purity. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I say it, truth and jest, but, but truly, I just think there's such a, um, you know, God will bless, uh, he will use a, a clean vessel. And so uh, just guard what your eyes are looking at and, and uh, what you allow in your mind. Uh, because if the enemy, you know, what plays out, what, what goes in our mind usually plays out in time. And so I would just say, you know, guard it. This is Galatians 5, 16 and 17. <laughs> I'm just telling you, that's how core this is. It discusses, Paul discusses how we do that how we do it yeah. and why we do it. And so that'll be great. All right, young marrieds, they got kids, they, they're adjusting to this life and marriage. Uh, Debbie, you want that one? Sure. Um, I would say check your priorities, watch your priorities, guard your priorities, um, that they're just biblically correct, that the Lord, that relationship comes first and then your spouse, and then your, then your kids, then your ministry. Um, I just feel like if you're, if you're young or having children and you have, you know, you get to dictate a lot in their lives, a lot. And so if your priorities are aligned, then it'll just be, it, it's just, it transfers and they see it and model, model it for them, model correct priorities. All right. Middle age? Middle age. Uh, I would encourage, just a word of encouragement, yep. right, to middle age. Uh, you know, that's halftime. So uh, at halftime, uh, I would just say you go back into the locker room and reassess what those priorities are and come out of the locker room stronger than ever going Execute. after it. Execute. Very good. Live for, it's that whole idea of, Bob Buford wrote that book, Halftime. We go from searching for uh, um, oh, what is it? Searching for significance to uh, he goes from searching for something to searching to significance. What, what are you living on purpose anyway? Yeah, um, um, good deliberateness. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, that type stuff. Yes. All right. Now you have not even remotely come close to old age, so I won't ask you to do that. But I'll tell I'll ask you this: What do you aspire to be living as you um, enter into the? you know, autumn and winter of life? Autumn and winter. Um, to always be pouring out. I think that's one, to me, that's more sharpening than being poured really into good, or being under teaching. It's just to continue to pour out, feed the other, feed younger generations. That's good. Um, Amen. Feed people in different stages of life. Okay, favorite hymn? Uh, because He Lives probably is my favorite my grandmother's favorite was at Calvary. I love Tis So Sweet. I love uh, Nothing But the Blood. I love You Knew I Need to Pick. Yeah, I love favorite all. modern song. No, modern Christian song. Uh, favorite modern Christian song. Uh, man, my playlist is full, Mark. Uh, I didn't know that one. Yes, yeah. in, in Christ alone, maybe. <laughs> all right. Debbie, favorite hymn? Um, Tis So Sweet and Amazing Grace. Amazing uh, sure. All right. Yeah. Do you have a favorite modern church song? Uh... I'm sure I do. I can't think of the titles. That's right okay. Now. That's okay. Sneak peek into your sermon in 30 seconds. Oh, 30 seconds. Easy. Uh, the answer for loneliness, that means they have to come though. The answer for loneliness is that we were made for relationship. Relationship with God, relationship with others. I'm going to unpack that. Okay, fantastic. Now, generally, and, and I'm a time uh, uh, freak, so we got to bring this to an end. And I could talk to you all all day long with everybody. Typically, I have a blessing for the class at the end, and I would typically have you do it, but instead, I'm going to ask the class to join me. Just hold your hand out from social distance, and let's bless Pastor Jarrett Thank and you. Debbie. Thank and you. so, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we as a class pour our blessing, which means we ask you to bless. Yes, Jesus. Pastor Jarrett and Debbie and their girls. Yes. Bless them with peace. Bless them with joy. Bless them with clarity of thought, clarity of mission. Put a, a, an anointing on their life, Father, that is apparently 
clearly, without a doubt, your spirit, that they can continue to walk the path that you've given them. We thank you for putting them in our church and for putting us under their care. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you.